Finley, you should come out of your shell. How about you come into it instead? Indigo Park is an indie horror game created by content creator Unique Geese, most known for both his YouTube channel with around 200,000 subscribers and his remake of the first Garden of Banban game, which was received very well. Indigo Park mainly gathered attention through both published news about the game as well as Unique Geese's frequent discussions of the topic on his channel. Attention and excitement for the game would slowly rise with the release of trailers and more discussions. The game looked to be unique and high quality for its genre, which was a breath of fresh air for many indie horror fans at the time. The game, as of writing this, was released yesterday and, aside from the more artistic aspects, seemed a bit lacking, at least I thought so when I played it for the first time. The concept alone had interested me, as making a horror game based on the Disney parks was something not done before to my knowledge. I was also enamoured by the history of the parks for a brief time in my life, and the idea of taking inspiration from all the abandoned rides and attractions, as well as the general mystery of Disneyland, seemed great for a horror game. However, that aspect, as well as gameplay and other things, seemed very underbaked in my opinion. Welcome! To cooking with Chef Unique Goose. <laughs> Indigo Park had the potential to be something truly groundbreaking for the indie horror genre, and in this video, I would like to take a look at the various criticisms I have about this game, but also provide some ideas as to how the game could be improved. But before we do dive into that, I'd first like to make note of what I thought the game did really well. There's no doubt in my mind that this game, despite its flaws, had a lot of work and effort put into it. This game is Unique Geese's passion project, being funded mostly right from his own pockets. The fact that he was able to get a functioning game out with this level of quality and this level of support is honestly inspiring. I'm not making this video to spite Unique Geese. If anything, I want to see this game be remembered as a gem in the indie horror genre, and if my later criticisms are taken into consideration, miraculously, along with other people's criticisms, this game can most certainly be that gem. But I'm jumping ahead. Let me first say what I do like about the game. For one, the art and animation is absolutely amazing. From my knowledge, it was mainly done by Jake Neutron and he killed it, with Rambly the Raccoon specifically being very energetic and expressive at times. Speaking of Rambly, he's the best part about this game. His voice actor, Otto Boy VA, fits the role completely and his delivery of some lines is just so endearing. My personal favourite being the line said when the player is going through the Rambly's railroad queue. Do you know why Rambly the raccoon loves Rambly's railroad? Because I like trains. I don't know, something about it is funny to me. Some of the environments in the game look really good as well. I personally like the Main Street USA type area with the Rambly Fountain. It's just so serene and there's a lot to explore there, kinda, maybe, I'll get to that. The music is also very good. I mainly like the more environmental tracks, but the Rambly's Railroad and Arcade game music were brilliant also. I wasn't too fond of the credit song myself, but I definitely appreciate the effort of having a whole last song in this game. Once again, just goes to show how passionate the developers were with this project. But that being said, I did have some grind with this game, which I'll get into now. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, to start with, the gameplay is far too simple. Most of the game consists of walking or running, your choice really, around different areas distributing one or two items to somewhere nearby, often with no resistance at all other than sheer will to do so. Take the first section of the game for example, where you have to place a cog in a generator to open a gate. Just get the cog, go over here, and you've done it. Move on to the next section. Go, go, go. And what's funny is that this is repeated again in another section as a reprieve from literally standing still. I think my main gripe here is that there's just no real challenge here, no obstacle to conquer. A way in which indie horror games, like Indigo Park, incorporate challenge into their gameplay is through puzzles. Maybe along with collecting cogs, there's a sorting puzzle at the generator where you have to place the cogs in just the right way to make them fit. You could even expand on this in following areas by making the cogs much harder to fit in. I haven't even changed a lot. And it's already got so much more complexity, and therefore, player engagement. But the game isn't just placing cogs and gears, no, it also has the wristband mechanic, inspired by Disneyland's magic bands, used in place of traditional park admission tickets or room keys for hotel guests. The wristband in Indigo Park is not a wristband, but a button you simply press to open doors and gates, sometimes with a small cutscene, sometimes without. The wristband mechanic is incredibly underutilized here. For one, pressing a button with the wristband and unlocking areas doesn't really feel all that special, as it's introduced so early 
early that you don't even know what life is like without it. Maybe on your way to get the wristband, there's different areas that are locked and need the wristband to be opened. That way it feels like you're unlocking more of the game, instead of just pressing buttons. And also, make that small cutscene happen each time you open an area. That's probably a bad idea, but at least it makes it seem more like a wristband than a glorified button presser. There's also some kind of leveling up side to it in the game. As for a brief moment in the Rambly Fountain, Main Street USA inspired section of the game. Wow, well, look at that! You're at Jetstream Junction! Oops, looks like Jetstream Junction's being tuned up! Last I checked, there's a security office in the back of the theater. Maybe a friendly wrangler can help you get in! A display appears, reading Orange Level Access Granted. This was to open an area you were only told about moments prior, by the way, so there's no real build up or feeling of unlocking something here. I feel like to make this mechanic better utilised, or at least in the way I want to, you also have to change other elements of the game, like the layout of the map, but only slightly. So let's say that when you first enter the Main Street USA area, Jetstream Junction and the theatre are clearly visible from the entrance, but both of them are inaccessible. Jetstream Junction, because of the comically large padlock, and the theatre are due to needing a high level wristband. Rambly Spiel is the same, but instead of just giving you orange access, he adds that to level it up, you have to do some sort of puzzle or challenge. Maybe this could involve going around the different areas of the map, collecting items that have meaning and possibly built to something, instead of just being collectibles. Maybe, maybe even going back to previously locked sections to collect these items. Now not only does this make the gameplay more interesting, Unique Geese, but you're also getting your money's worth with the map, as players will now have a motive to explore it, unlike before where there are plenty of areas areas and buildings to walk around, but they were mostly empty, if not for a single, uh, let's be real, useless collectible. Now the last section of the game from here on out, in terms of gameplay, is pretty inoffensive. The Jetstream Junction area itself is fine, although my mentioning of making collectibles in areas have more of a function also applies here. The soft play area, right before the chase scene, is absolutely revolutionary for this game. How you ask? There is a puzzle, which is based on exploration. Unique geese, you already met all my complaints here, why didn't you just apply this to the rest of the game? The chase scene afterwards is just a worse version of the Poppy Playtime Chapter 1 chase, I'm sorry. You could have ended this game in a much better, much more unique way, although I'm not really sure how you would go about doing that. Considering this is an indie horror game, maybe look at how previous games like Bendy and the Ink Machine or any other game tackle their endings, other than a chase scene. I just think it's really overdone in the genre. Steering away from gameplay now, there are some other attributes about this game that grind my gears, like Rambly. Yeah, it's weird, but Rambly's both a good and bad part about this game. I think it mainly boils down to how much he's used. This game, and probably its developers, really like Rambly. Like really like Rambly. I love you, Mr. Beast. He talks a lot in this game, and a lot of the time in places where I don't think it's all that necessary. I played through the game again just to count how many Rambly moments there were, and not counting the collectible voice lines, there were around 23 Rambly moments. That's a lot of Rambly moments, and most of them are just to add character or humour to the game. And while that's great, I feel Rambly Rambly's primary purpose should be just to guide you throughout the game, telling you where to go or what to do, maybe doing so in a humorous way. However, that isn't Rambly's only purpose, as some of his voice lines are also just to emphasize how abandoned and in disrepair the park is, which, while doing its job well, could be done through a plethora of other means, like having notes left behind, or even symbolically through the environment, not only to keep the player engaged with the different formats, but also to not just rely on Rambly as much to tell the game's story. With Rambly talking so much, Welcome to Indigo Park! Hi! Rambly. What's the hold up? Every guest needs a critter, cuff. Here you go, buddy. Uh-oh, the door mysteriously locked. <laughs> It can also affect the pacing of the game, so having him talk less, and only doing so when appropriate, keeps the game going without grinding it to a halt. This could be just a nitpick, but I also feel he's just too friendly a character. <laughs> having someone who's maybe a bit abrasive or even unreliable as your guide can help in establishing an oppressive tone for your horror game, going against the preconceived notion that tutorial characters in games should be trustworthy and comforting, but horror is another attribute that I'll bring up later, so I won't get into too much detail here. Speaking of horror, one of the game's most prominent methods of trying to scare you is through the evil versions of its mascot characters, Molly McCaw and Lloyd specifically. These versions are portrayed as living and breathing creatures which I think is a weird move for this game. Indigo Park is a game inspired by the Disney Parks, and the Disney Parks are known for their use of audio animatronics. In fact, the Disney company invented the fucking things. Audio animatronics? Right, audio animatronics. 
Audio for sound. See, and electronically animated by sound. So they chose to not take advantage of the uncanny and disturbing nature of these audio animatronics for the evil versions of these characters, and instead make them the Garden of Ban Ban style organic life forms. Seems like a completely missed opportunity. Oh, and you can't say, Oh, Funny to Freddy's did animatronics first. This game couldn't have done that. Because the animatronics that Indigo Park would have taken influence from would have been completely different to Five Nights at Freddy's animatronics. And the developers aren't afraid of treading on Five Nights at Freddy's turf because animatronic versions of these characters are in the game, but just aren't used to their full potential, which is just baffling. Moving on, another point that I feel could have been improved upon was that of the collectible aspect of the game. Throughout the game, you have a chance to explore some places off the beaten path for a chance to find a small piece of Indigo Park merchandise to collect. Can I just mention here to start with that while Unique East has gone on record saying he wouldn't want any merchandise for the game to be made just yet, he is just itching to do so. Just look at all the things in the gift shops, not to mention the collectibles. It's almost as if he's asking you, you know, yeah, you like this, yeah, you want this. But yeah, collectibles in this game don't really serve that much of a purpose, other than getting to see more Rambly voice lines, or to be told a sliver more about the park. The way the collectibles are handled are very similar to the way in which Finance of Freddy's Security Breach handles collectibles, now that I think about it. However, while Finance of Freddy's Security Breach rewards the player for collecting all the items by granting them the VIP ending, Indigo Park doesn't do a lot of value, other than showing you more rambly. Because you can always have more rambly. Maybe, for collecting all the collectibles, you would be able to unlock different areas on a second playthrough. These areas could be faster routes for speedrunners, or even just more areas with aforementioned notes or environmental storytelling. It wouldn't have been a lot, granted, but it would have been a lot more than just getting more rambly. And now, for my final point, I would like to mention the sheer lack of horror in this indie horror game. But it's not like it doesn't try to scare you. There are definitely moments where the game uses the environment and its characters to inspire fear, but it just doesn't work with that much. Or maybe I've just grown, I don't know. But indie horror games use these methods all the time, so why doesn't it work here? Well, I think it boils down to a number of things. To start with, the atmosphere visually is a bit naff, and I feel the lighting is the main reason why. Specifically, the over-reliance on the flashlight. Indigo Park is incredibly dark for 90% of the game, almost forcing the player to use their flashlight. However, this destroys any atmosphere that could be created through environmental lighting, and instead just makes the game seem flat and uninteresting. But it's not like the environments are completely void of light, as there are tons of places in the game that use environmental lighting and make the game much more moody and atmospheric when the flashlight's turned off. If the game just leaned into this a little bit more, I feel going around the park would actually be quite tense, or at least more so. Along with the atmosphere, I also felt the game showed too much of the monsters for them to be scary. There are many times throughout the game where you can see the evil versions of Molly McCaw and Lloyd in plain sight, not really being obstructed by anything, and so when they are eventually revealed in jump scares or chase scenes, it has less of an impact because the player knows what the threat looks like. I feel that maybe having less moments that show the monsters hiding and running around corners, as well as maybe hiding them in the dark with some environmental lighting, could have helped in making them seem much more menacing and unknowable. That way, the eventual moment where the build-up is paid off will be a lot more impactful and frightening. Not only that, but you could also make their small appearances throughout the game more startling with loud noises, be it environmental or through stingers, as to emphasise their role as a threat to the player. Above all else though, the best way to scare a player is by doing so in ways that haven't really been done before. Indie horror is awash with predictable tropes and scare tactics that, instead of being embraced, should really be avoided in turn for more unique and impactful scares. If you're looking for inspiration, then there's no better place to look than actual horror games. Take My Friendly Neighbourhood for instance, that, instead of completely relying on jump scares and chase scenes, decided to take a page out of Survival Horror's book and include game mechanics and puzzles inspired by Resident Evil and Silent Hill. And while the game's overall tone and themes aren't particularly scary, nor are they meant to be, the gameplay alone can make for some incredibly tense moments. Obviously this game and Indigo Park have completely different tropes, but my point still stands that just doing what every other indie horror game is doing will not make you stand out. I feel like I've gone a bit overboard here and there, so let's get back to the point. understand that I'm not the majority in giving these criticisms, and how could I be? Indigo Park is such an endearing game, and Unique Geese has poured so much time, money, and effort into it, it would be insulting to imagine someone soullessly tearing it all down. But frankly, I don't want to see this game crumble away to nothing. I bought the makeshift toy for god's sake, I don't hate this thing. If anything, I want to see Indigo Park flourish and be remembered for years to come, and by sharing my thoughts like this, as well as possibly giving others an opportunity to do so, maybe that could happen. Indigo Park has only just released its first chapter 
chapter, and the game could evolve and expand over time to become something truly special. I mean, many games in the indie horror genre have used the chapter-based release system to not only evolve their games, but also rework older elements. Bendy and the Ink Machine did this, often completely remastering old chapters along with the release of new ones. And by the looks of Indigo Park's Kickstarter page, as well as the funding of the makeshift plush, Chapter 2 is going to have a much bigger budget compared to Chapter 1, so I suppose we should just wait and see where Indigo Park has in store for the future. Alright, so uh, those are my thoughts on Indigo Park. I decided to uh, change out to Gmod just because- oh, fuck. <laughs> I decided to change out to Gmod because um, I found this little rambly avatar type character and I thought that would be good for the video. And also just for a change of scenery, I used quite a lot of the footage for Indigo Park. Um, I apologize for the low quality of just the whole video. <laughs> I was gonna record like my own gameplay footage of the, uh, of the, of the game. OBS just didn't want to record the game for some reason. I don't know if that's the game's fault. Probably OBSs and then so I was just gonna get gameplay from YouTube and just download it but um the YouTube to mp4 site that I used really compressed the files so uh that was why um I found a new site now that shouldn't have that problem so the next video is probably gonna be a lot better if this video seems kind of rushed then I mean I, I mean it probably was <laughs> the thing was I started writing this when Indigo Park came out which was like March 18th I'm pretty sure I wrote, I started writing the script the day it came out. And so I've kind of just been pushing myself to get this video out as soon as possible because I didn't really want to be late to the topic. But I somehow still fucking was because there are like videos that have been just like do the exact same thing my video is trying to do. I just hope the points that I've said are somewhat unique and are like still of value. <laughs> oh yeah, I kind of forgot to mention some points here and there. The ambience I forgot to mention was really good. It adds unease and tension to the game which it desperately needs because it's a horror game and horror games need to be scary. But yeah, that's more or less it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have any points of your own that like you'd like to say? I think it's a conversation worth having. But yeah, if you liked this video, found it interesting at all, why not give it a like? I would very appreciate that. If you really, really, really enjoyed this video and want to see more from me in the future, be sure to subscribe. Yeah, no, I have a lot of videos planned that I want to do. And yeah, I would be really grateful if you would be interested in seeing where I go next. But anyway, that's enough from me. Thank you for watching.